Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome to the fourth session of the Authentic Persuasion live training sessions. If you're watching this right now online, this is a recording. I am actually traveling to a conference right now when this is being broadcast. So I but I didn't want to uh, miss the window. I didn't want to miss the chance to put out some content here, at least to share what I wanted to cover in this week's topic, even though I'll be traveling. And uh, if you're watching this now, uh, this is a replay. Again, it'll say that in the comments. I don't want to mislead anyone and make them think that this is a live thing. Um, and as you're watching this, you can also still comment. So no matter when you're checking this out or any video of mine or anyone's video, whether this is on LinkedIn, uh, Facebook, on YouTube, even if it's on Instagram, you can always comment, like, share after the fact as a replay. I still get those notifications. So as you're going through this, even though this isn't live, if you want to post any comments, any questions, put that in there. I will get notified about those. Would love to interact with you as well if you're watching the replay. And of course, if you're checking this out on the podcast, then welcome. Obviously, this is a replay on podcast because those aren't live. And if you're watching this and you would like to listen to the podcast as well as watch it each week or just go back and forth, the podcast is available. So it's through the Authentic Persuasion Show. That's the podcast that I'm using this for, these replays, and you can find these. My goal is to have these come out on Friday and do these sessions for you, and then by Monday, be able to put them out as a podcast there. So by the beginning of the next week, you can tune in, maybe supercharge yourself for the week, for sales, help yourself in some way so you can close more deals. Now, the thing is, I want to always start with explaining why I'm doing these. The thing is, is that what I have come to embrace and realize is that my mission is made up of three parts. It's to facilitate transformation by enabling and encouraging light bulb moments, by helping the underdog win their game, whatever game that is, and then also to leave people better than I found them. And so that's why I'm doing this is to put out content to help people, to encourage those light bulb moments, to help underdogs in sales, which is what I consider myself. I've always kind of considered myself to be an underdog. When I fell into sales, I didn't receive any training. I had no idea it was even considered sales. And uh, it kicked off definitely a rough, uh, I'll say a few years of trying to figure out what sales actually means, how to persuade people, and the consequences of what happens when you're not effective at that. Um, and then I always want to leave people better off than I found them, I came across them. And so this is my way of giving back. And as I'm going through this, if you have any questions or anything like that, put them in the chat. Also, what you can do is you can always email me. And there's a bunch of things now that I am compiling a lot of the documents, checklists, and things that I give out, especially to some of my clients when I'm working with their teams. I'm making those available as I'm mentioning them or things are coming up or worksheets that I'm creating. So you can always email me, jason at cutterconsultinggroup.com, where you can um, you just email me that mention what it is that I talked about, what you want, whether it's a PDF, it's an ebook, it's a checklist. You can always email me that. Also questions, suggestions, ideas, things that you have in mind. I have a lot of different projects going on uh, with other podcasts and books and things like that. So I'm always open to hear from people. Um, at the end of the broadcast, I will mention a couple of things, including how to get Selling with Authentic Persuasion as a free book. I will sign it. I will send it to you. You just pay for shipping. And so I'll mention that. And then depending on when you're catching this, keep in mind that I'm doing this, assuming I'm in person. If not, I will record them, at least put them out. Uh, I'm doing these each uh, each Friday at noon Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific. So just make sure to tune into that. You can get reminders everywhere. Again, like I said, it's on LinkedIn, it's on Facebook, it's on YouTube, I'm trying to put them on Instagram as well. And so wherever, whatever platform you prefer, look for it there, come find it, look for these sessions. So last week, what I covered was two main topics. It's so important as I'm helping build the framework about what you want to focus on. And again, I mentioned this last week, a lot of people want the tactics, they want the strategies, they want the things that like, what do I have to say? How do I, how do I have to do this? How can I close more deals? What questions should I ask? And, and people want to know these specifics. 
The challenge is, is that unless you have the fundamentals, unless you have a foundation built of you and who you are and how you operate, all of those tools, strategies, tactics, all of those will fall flat. It's why you can see somebody using some, let's say, phrases very, very effective in their sales process. And you see other people try those same phrases and it falls flat. It's not as effective. And the reason why is because they don't have that same foundation, that same confidence, that same experience. And that's what's really missing. And that's why on this journey together, now in session four, we're focusing on the first part, the main part, which is you, which is the authenticity piece. Again, the book is Selling with Authentic Persuasion. Persuasion will get to. Persuasion is the sales part. It's how you persuade somebody to take action on the right course for them to help them in some way achieve a goal or get out of pain. Persuasion is so important. You can't have one, the authenticity, without the persuasion if you want to be effective in sales. There's a lot of people who are very authentic and then very ineffective at persuasion. There's also people who go hard on the persuasion. They think that's all they need and they're very inauthentic and that doesn't work as a long-term strategy. It doesn't sustain itself very well and because it's missing that. And again, where we're starting is the authenticity piece. If you have a copy of Selling with Authentic Persuasion, then you can kind of follow along, treat this kind of like as your weekly book club as I'm going through chapters and topics within the book and then adding to it and based on what I've learned since I wrote the book and what comes to mind, then you can do that. If you don't have a copy, again, Wait till the end and I'll mention how you can get your free copy or you can order on Amazon. It's also available uh, via Audible and it's also Kindle or you can just email me and I can set you up. So last week we talked about two main topics, two very important one uh, topics for you. One is fear and one is why. And so the key is, is to know your fear. Make sure to go back and check out session number three. Again, it's available for replay everywhere as well as on the podcast. Knowing fear, knowing what you're afraid of, knowing what might be holding you back and causing you to hesitate from making those phone calls, pushing yourself, moving the conversations forward, like what is going on inside of you that's holding you back is so important because that's one of the biggest things. It's tough. It's tough being a human. It's literally difficult to be a human because our brain is always on alert for danger and it would rather accidentally and misidentify danger and everything is dangerous, then miss that one lion that it didn't see because it just assumes everything is good, right? It wants to assume everything is a is a is a lion, everything is a spider, everything is out to get you. It's why when you walk through your house or when you're walking around, sometimes you see something out of your corner of your eye and you you jump and you startle when you see a shadow or something because our brain is trained to keep us alive and keep us safe. Again, it would rather see the spider that's not there, but make you react than miss the one that is there and then bad things happen. So you got to know that fear. There's also an exercise that I did. Make sure to go back and check it out that I explained. It comes from Tim Ferriss. It's called fear setting. And that one is really important. Then the other part that I talked about was your why, understanding your why, knowing why, W-H-Y, capital W-H-Y, why you're in sales, why you want to be successful in sales, why you want to close more deals, why you want to make money. Now, everyone always says, well, I want to make money. I didn't say that. I said, why do you want to make money? Why do you want to make that amount of money? What does it mean to you? What is it going to do for you? And why is that important to you? And dig as deep as possible. Many people suggest the five whys. So you say, okay, I want to make more money. Okay, why do you want to make more money? That's one. Okay, why that? Okay, now why that? Okay, now why that? And why that? And just ask yourself five times, why do you want such and such? Or why is such and such important to you? Keep digging down. Maybe it takes seven times, depending on how shallow each one is for you. Just keep digging down until you find the most passionate, energetic, exciting thing that's going to drive you. And again, keep in mind, we talked about why is being careful not to have any judgment on your whys because sometimes people go, well, they want a house and they have a family and all I want is a new cell phone or a new car and that's not as important and you know it's not a big deal and it's it's I'm not gonna be passionate about buying a cell phone. 
You still want to dig deep. You want to figure it out because your why is your why. And it's important to you, not anybody else. So keep that in mind. So what's important to you? Because that's what's going to drive you because sales is hard. Sales is full of failure. Even when you're winning, you're losing more times than you're not in those conversations. And so you've got to have something that pushes you forward. And then the key is, is to take your why, take the things that you want, take the reasons why you want it, and make a visual reminder of that as a vision board so that you've got that in front of you, preferably over your computer or over your phone, such that whenever you're struggling, you look at that and go, that's why I'm doing this. That's why I'm going to pick myself up after getting hung up on 10 times, 50 times, 100 times. I'm going to give it one more shot, just one more, maybe the next one, just going to keep going. So that's the long kind of recap on that. Such an important piece. I see these two things as very, very fundamental. Do these two things. When I am training sales teams and training and working with individuals, these two parts, we go into depth, like a lot of information on this because they're so important. And again, email me jason at cutterconsultinggroup.com and I have worksheets, I have ebooks, whether you're a salesperson, if you're a manager, if you lead other salespeople, then I can I have an ebook that's available on Amazon, but I'm happy to send it to you for free. And it's on motivating your sales team. So uh, email me that if you're a salesperson, you want help with vision board, a worksheet, you want to understand your fears, email me again, Jason at cutterconsultinggroup.com. Happy to send you those. Uh, anything that I've got, anything to help you with your selling effectiveness and with this authentic piece. All right. Now, here we are, 12 minutes in. Let's dive into the content uh, about week four. So uh, week four, session four, this one's all about acknowledging your strengths. That's the big topic for today that for the rest of our time together that I want to focus on. Um the biggest key, and, and there's this debate, and I've I've had this debate with many people. I've read it in many different ways. Is do you do you acknowledge your strengths and focus on your strengths and ignore your weaknesses? Do you improve your weaknesses so you can get better on that part and make your weaknesses into strengths? That one is tough. And I'm gonna give you some good framework, some things to think about as far as what might most be most important, especially in your sales career. I'm not talking about all strengths. I'm not talking about all weaknesses. This is for you, the salesperson, and I'm focused on helping you master your authentic self-awareness side so that you can be a sales professional and be a persuasion master. That is my goal. So we're, this is all in terms of sales. Now, you could have other strengths, other weaknesses, things outside of that, that's up to you in those contexts. Here, we're talking about sales. I'm here to help you in sales. So the biggest thing, and this is my perspective, the first part, and this is obviously the authenticity piece and the self-awareness piece, is to embrace who you are. I think that is so important. Um, it is to know who you are and embrace who you are. I will speak about myself. That was a huge challenge for me for most of my life. Even into my like late 30s, one of the things that I struggled with a lot was the fact that I had a very windy path and I didn't even know at that point what my direction was, where I wanted to go. And a lot of times I was embarrassed by my path and my past. I can remember several times standing out in my memory because it was so clear, not that the other person made me feel bad, but that I felt bad. And I could, I, I remember this one guy I was talking to and I was actually uh, uh, transitioning and traveling to the Middle East for some contract stuff I was doing. And I remember where I was sitting when I was talking to him and he said that he had gone to school, got his degree in architecture, and then he was doing uh, architect uh, design and then projects like that where he was going. And then um, he asked me what I was doing. I told him what I did. And he asked me if that my degree was in that or if I was in the military. And I had said no. And my degree was in marine biology. And um, there was this glimmer in his eye that was like, that doesn't make any sense. And that's weird. And I don't get it. And that's one of the things I struggled with is that, you know, American dream and path that 
seemed like the right thing to do that I think is obviously not. And I think a lot of people struggle with that, thinking they have to go one route. We see, you know, younger generations coming up knowing like they're not going to go that path at all versus what, you know, people in my generation were given from parents being like, you get a degree that helps you get a really good job. You get a career, you're in that career long term. And then you have that stability and then you have some retirement, you have those things to, to look forward to and you have a family and you have a house and, you know, you check all these boxes in the American dream. And obviously that doesn't exist. That hasn't existed for a very long time. Um, but in my brain, I thought that's what you had to do. And if you didn't, then you were less than. Uh, and it wasn't until, again, from my until my late 30s where I finally embraced it. I finally realized, wait a second, here's who I am. And all of the things that I have done up to that point in my life, and even till now, have made me who I am, such that the wide range of experiences I've had, jobs that I've had, which is it pales in comparison to other people I know who have done way more various jobs, right? We've all met that person who like has done every type of job under the sun in their life. I have had enough experiences and varied enough experiences such that, uh, A, I understand a lot of things about a lot of different businesses. Uh, I've also been through enough stuff in life personally that I wouldn't wish on anyone else. And so I also have a level of empathy for most situations. I mean, I haven't had a lot of health and or family related, you know, health issues and things like that. However, I can relate on a lot of different levels. And what I found is that all those experiences and the things that I've done make it so that I can have a conversation about a lot of different topics and be very interested in the other person and, and provide some kind of, you know, feedback or ideas or, you know, uh, conversation to it in so many different topics. And that has helped in rapport building. It has helped in business. It has helped in, uh, in sales and selling such that I finally realized it not that long ago relative to my life that instead of being embarrassed and ashamed of where I had been in the path and my ups and my downs and the windy road is realizing, wait a second, like that's actually made me who I am, which makes me so effective at what I do, especially talking with people and understanding people and, and, and being able to relate on some level. And I think that's very effective. And I think what's interesting too, is that most people, I think actually feel the same way I did, which is, you know, if they only knew what my path was, then maybe they would think less of me. Or I wish I had that straight path like very few people actually do. And uh, I think that comparison is so tough. So my suggestion, stop comparing, stop worrying about what other people are doing and embrace who you are, embrace your strengths and embrace what you like, don't like, how you operate, what you don't do. And, and this is the biggest thing. And then if we look in the, the animal kingdom, our primal brain wants to do the same thing. And I know I keep talking about the primal brain a lot and, and the, the, the amygdala, that part of our brain that's focused on survival and thriving as a group and a tribe. But this is so important. It's interesting that if you want to be really effective at sales and selling and persuading people, First, you have to understand how your mind is working and what has gone into your mind over these millennium as a human, as a species, and then also apply those to your prospect so you understand what you're up against in their mind that they might not even be aware about such that you can help persuade them to make a change. And so that's the reason why I keep bringing this up. The more you can study this stuff, the more you can study human behavior, the brain, the subconscious, limitations, fears, what holds people back, their desires, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, those kind of things. The more you can study that, I firmly believe it will make you a more effective salesperson and potentially just a more effective human because you will understand what makes you tick, what makes you happy, and how to do more of that so that you can be happy and effective in this lifetime. So the thing is, is if we look at the animal kingdom, and this is important when we're talking about your strengths, is a lot of people don't embrace their strengths. They don't embrace who they are as an individual. And the reason why is individuals get 
killed. And what do I mean by that? Well, if we look at the animal kingdom, and I'll talk about the one that I know really well, which is the water, the ocean, the sea, is if we look at fish, there's a lot of fish that school. And some of them, you've ever seen those videos where there's a school of fish. It's really tight school. And it almost like this, like, heaping ball as it's just kind of swarming around, almost like a swarm of bees, except it's actually fish. And then what happens is you see in these nature videos where there's a predator that's coming at it and wants to eat it, right? Maybe there's a tuna that's trying to eat these bait fish and this thing, it's even called a bait ball and where there's just this ball, tuna's trying to get to it. The problem is, is that when it's in that ball, there's so many things going on that literally the fish, the predator that's trying to attack it and, and eat, can't pick out a single target. And the problem is, is that they can't pick out a single target. So they're going in blind and they're just charging through it. Fish move out of the way. Nothing, unless it's just really unlucky, is going to get eaten. And so the animal kingdom has learned to do that in some situations where those fish are schooling to protect themselves. You think, okay, well, if they're in that big ball and make it easier to eat as they go through it, and that's just not the case because they can't single out one target. And then what happens is you'll see in these videos, uh, these nature videos, where one fish will break off from the group or the predator fish will tear through and break off a couple of fish that get you know, sidetracked or lose track of the school of fish, the big bait ball. Then what happens is there's one or two fish that are outliers and they're on their own. Predator sees them, locks in on that one target and they're toast, right? Going straight after it. Once that one stands out, it's over. In schooling fish, they know that's the case. The ones who get separated from the group, from the school, get killed. It's also why if you look at another animal, which is sheep, where sheep, it's interesting, and there's even a term for this that we use as people in our society, which is, you know, being a black sheep, and being a black sheep means that you stand out, and the reason why and where that comes from is sheep are generally one color, mostly bred to be white, mostly to be consistent. The challenge is, is that when a sheep comes out as a different color and just some genetic thing happens, they come out as black or spots or stripes, then what happens is there's now one that stands out that's different. So the rest of the sheep are one color. You've got one that's a different color. What happens when wolves or predators come? Well, if you've ever seen sheep, they flock and they run together. And it's this big marshmallowy blob that you can't really tell which one is which. It's hard to identify one sheep out of this mass, this flock that's running around, especially running from a predator, unless there's one that's different. When there's one that's different, it stands out. And that one that stands out, it's easy to lock in on, right? Then the wolf, the wolves, the predators can lock in on that one that's different and say, going after that one, right? And then that one gets taken out. And our brain feels the same way. Our mind, because we're a tribal society, wants to fit in and doesn't want to stand out for that same reason. That's why, again, you hear that term, the black sheep of the family, the black sheep of the of the group. It's that person who's different. They're, they're, one of these things is not like the other, right? Like they're not playing along. They're not doing what everyone else is doing in that family. Maybe everyone's a doctor and you got this one person who's doing something different as a career and then they're considered the black sheep. They're different. They stand out. They're beating, they're moving to the beat of their own drum. And in this situation, what I want you to do is fight that instinct, fight the innate human survival side of us that wants to fit in. And it's not that we just want to fit in because we're just a lemming that wants to go along with it. It goes deeper than that because fitting in means we're with the tribe. If we're with the tribe, then we're going to survive. If we're not with the tribe, we're out on our own in the cold, dangerous world. And that's not a good place to be. Usually don't make it. At least it wasn't that long ago when people who weren't a part of the tribe were actually making it. So that's what our brain is doing. I want you to embrace your strength. I know this is a whole lot of background. You were thinking, hey, when is Jason going to get to the good stuff about helping me close more deals? And I am because the key is, is you want to embrace who you are. You want to be okay with being different. You want to be you and authentically you. I cannot count the number of times 
that I have been in call centers, in sales, on sales floors, in sales teams, observing, watching, working with them, where I have seen somebody who I talk to when they're not on the sales floor or they're not on the phones. And then they get onto the sales floor and they become something different. They want to match what everyone's doing. They want to do what everyone's doing so they can fit in, maybe so they can be accepted, maybe because they think that's what it takes to be successful in sales. And the challenge is, is that if that's not authentic to you, it's really hard to sustain long term. Pretending, acting, putting on a front, fake it till you make it, act as if that's tough long term. Short term, there's some reasons you can justify doing some of those. Long term, it's not going to work. What I'd rather you do is embrace who you are. Embrace your strengths. Embrace what you're bringing to the table and stop judging yourself. Stop thinking, okay, well, I'm not like Bob. Bob sells this way. He says these things. Bob's been doing sales for 15 years. So I should just do what Bob does. I'm not like that. I haven't been in sales very long. Um, I still have that. I still have that where I think I talk to people, especially for my podcast, especially for the books that I do. Like I'm interviewing people, talking to other people who are in sales, sales experts, consultants, and people who they've been in sales for a very long time. They knew they wanted to be in sales. They love sales. They're excited about it. That's what they wanted to do for a long time and they absolutely love it. And I think to myself, I didn't want to do sales for a long time. In fact, even once I started in sales, I still ran away from it several times because I didn't think I wanted to be in sales. I didn't think I was good at it. I never got any training or guidance or mentorship about it. And so I basically raised myself, ran away from home, the home of sales several times, and then you know came back and embraced it. And here I am now. But the key is don't judge yourself. Don't judge who you aren't and don't judge the strengths that you have. You want to focus on your strengths and you want to focus on what makes you you, what makes you happy and what you can bring to the table in these conversations and focus on your strengths. Now, what are your strengths? <laughs> That's up to you. That's each person has their unique strengths, <coughs> excuse me, that they're bringing to the table. Here's what I realized. And, and if you've heard me talk about my background, you know, I've mentioned this before. One of the keys is I grew up with two fantastic, loving parents who are still together to this day after 46 years of marriage. <coughs> and they were both pretty analytical. When I was growing up, they were in analytical careers, accounting, finance, engineering, project management. They both moved their way up in their respective organizations. And it was a very analytical. I didn't grow up in an entrepreneurial house or a sales house or a business focused house. Uh, it was more analytical. And so for me, my brain, if we look at nature versus nurture, I had both of those stacked for me to be analytical and to see the world that way. And that's what it was. That's why I've always been better in science and math than English and literature and language. When I got into my first sales role at 27, it was in the mortgage business. Now in the mortgage business in 2002, it was essentially order taking. Everybody, and I lived in Seattle and was doing it in that general area, is everybody wanted to buy a house. Everyone wanted to refi their loans. At the time, the rates were amazing, which now if we look at the rates, it's hilarious because uh, that was low at the time. Now it's just even lower, uh, but everyone wanted help. And you didn't have to, I didn't learn anything about sales. I didn't learn anything about persuading people. I didn't learn any, about closing people um, because it was just literally people coming in. In fact, we joked, there was people who joked and said, you know, if you want to make six figures in the mortgage business in that day and age, all you had to do was answer your phone sometimes. Um, and that was about it. You didn't have to return any messages because people would just keep calling you. And, and that's what it took. And that was semi true, but gives you a good idea. And what I realized is that when I sat in those meetings with people who wanted to buy a house, my analytical side kicked in, plus my dislike and distrust of salespeople and being feeling like I was being pressured into buying the kind of buyer that I am. I want options. I don't want any pressure. 
I want to know that what I'm going to do is going to be the right decision, the best decision, and I want the freedom to make that choice. And so what happened as a salesperson, being totally unconscious and unaware that I was selling like I like to buy, which we're going to talk about in another session because that one is a super important one for you to be aware of. But what I didn't realize was I was selling like I like to buy. And so I was giving people lots of options and lots of space. And I was giving them lots of spreadsheets with so many choices of what they could pick and what combination that it was actually making it worse. Not only was I not closing sales and, and moving people forward, I was actually repelling people because I was giving them too many choices and triggering analysis paralysis. Now, the reason why I mentioned that story now is because those things are some of my best strengths. Other people might try to tell me, you don't want to do those, right? Don't be so analytical. Don't worry about asking so many questions. Don't worry about trying to actually help them or solve them problem. Just get them to buy this thing, right? We're selling this widget. You're putting too much effort into actually, you know, making sure it's the right thing for them. Just sell this widget. If you know me at all, you know, that's not going to fly because that's not the kind of salesperson I am. That's not the kind of human I am where I want to get somebody to buy something just so that I can get paid and I don't really care what happens to them or the outcome. Like that's not going to happen for me. So what I realized though, and once I learned the lesson of what I was doing wrong in providing too many options, like the cheesecake factory menu, I realized that what I was doing though, that was a really good strength was the analytical side. It was being able to act like a detective, like a scientist, ask questions, listen, listen for the things that were said, listen for the things that weren't said, pick up the details, identify what somebody wanted, what's that outcome they were going for, and then solve that, right? That analytical piece, the way my mind works as a problem solver, I see that as a very good strength. That's a huge one for me. Now, the thing is, and I'll talk about this in a few minutes, is that you've got to be careful because it is possible, and it happens with every single one, is that for every strength that you have, it can also be a giant weakness. It can be a huge issue if you're not careful. Again, if someone is thinking like I am, is very analytical and goes into sales conversations very analytical, then usually what happens if they're not careful, the weakness side of that will be uh, when somebody says, hey, can you send me more information? Or they'll even offer and say, hey, I'm sure you want to take your time with this. Let me send you a bunch of spreadsheets, brochures, pamphlets, PDFs, documents, testimonials, all these things, and just give that person a barrage of analytics, metrics, data, things like that because they're thinking that's what everyone's going to want. So you've got to be careful. And every strength, any strength can also be a weakness. And the bigger a strength is, it can also be a equally bigger weakness, if not careful. And so the key is self-awareness. What are your strengths? An activity I want you to do for this next week, as, as soon as you listen to this, you can pause it right now or just wait until it's done. What I want you to do is I want you to think about the strengths that you have as a person, as you, who you are. What are the strengths that you have that fit in with a sales career? What are those? Do you like spreadsheets? Do you like data? Can you talk to anybody? Can you talk to anybody about anything? Are you a empathetic listener? Do you Are you able to be quick with answers or responses, right? Almost like an improv, whatever that is, whatever the strengths are, I want you to write all those down and list them and no judgment. This is what I said earlier, no judgment. Just take everything, list it out there, and then look at that list and list as many as you can, whatever. Again, no judgment, just figure that list out for you. What does that look like? That's the first step. Second step is to take that list and think about it, maybe circle the top five strengths, right? Because you might end up with a list of like 10, 15, 20 of them, some weird random ones you didn't even realize you had. What are the top five? Then this is the key. For those top five ones, how well are you maximizing those strengths in your sales career and your selling effectiveness? And then rate yourself 
on a scale of zero to 10, 10 being the most, you're using it, you're crushing it, you're all about your strengths, you're living those strengths, you embrace who you are, you know who you are, and you're bringing all that, or zero, you have them, maybe you just realized them, and you're not doing anything with them, and just all fake and phony. Now, I'm going to guess if you're watching this, if you're listening to this, you're not fake and phony. Most people aren't 100% fake and phony, so it might be somewhere on that continuum. Then the key, and this is the third step in this exercise, if you didn't rate yourself a 10, what can you use from what I talked about, what I've talked about for the other three sessions so far, or if you've got the book Selling with Authentic Persuasion from the rest of the information from the chapter that this is in, what can you use from what I covered to move yourself to a 10 and maximize your strengths? So do that. So again, take a piece of paper, whatever you want to use, write down all of your strengths that you can think of that help you in sales, anything and everything. Then circle the top five that are the most impactful for selling and your selling effectiveness in your career. And then rate yourself zero to 10. And if you didn't give yourself a 10 for using all of those strengths in your sales career and your selling effectiveness, if you're holding back in any way, then why is it? What can you use from what we've talked about, what you know, what you've read, what can you use to move yourself to a 10 out of 10 on maximizing those strengths? All right. So important, focus on your strengths because the more you focus on that and who you are, you won't feel the need to copy somebody else, be an imposter, pretend to be a different kind of salesperson, mimic what you see. I think if you're not sure what's authentic to you and how you like to sell, if you're new to sales, then that's a great way to go. Copy what you see, copy what other people are doing around you, and then see what resonates and then mold that to who you are and your strengths. I know I was that way in the beginning. I was just copying and listening and, and doing what everyone else was doing. And then over the years, I've just made it my own to embrace who I am and what I bring to the table that's unique and authentic to me. So that's your strengths. So important to focus on your strengths, not anyone else's strengths. Now, before we wrap up, I think it's also equally important that we talk about weaknesses, right? And I don't generally like to focus on weaknesses too much um, because I'm more in the camp of let's build up our strengths. How do we get our strengths to be stronger and more effective and just win from a place of our strengths instead of worrying about our weaknesses. But here's the big thing is, like I said, our biggest strengths can be our biggest weaknesses. I mentioned that with the spreadsheet example and being over analytical and just like killing deals, like shooting myself in the foot when it came to selling uh, people on moving forward. Um, but here's the deal with weaknesses. Here's how I feel about that is, it's also really important to focus on weaknesses and not forget about them when they're things that can help you significantly with your selling effectiveness, whether it's mindset or it's the actual practical, tactical way that you sell, have conversations, whatever that looks like. I think it's important to be aware of those weaknesses and then improve the ones that are pivotal, pivotal and important in your selling process. And I'll give you an example. Again, I didn't know I was in sales. Like the first two years, I didn't realize I was in sales. My title was in sales. It was loan officer. I didn't think I was in sales. That's not what I thought sales was. Then I started helping people who were in foreclosure. And I still didn't think that was sales. I still didn't think that's what I was doing. But I learned more about persuasion and that, uh, you know, effectiveness at helping people move forward. Then I went to work for a company. And the side note with this, which is funny, is that when I went to work for that company, I was the director of operations. I didn't even want to be in sales. They already had a, a director of VP of sales. And so uh, I just wanted to be on the operation side. I wanted to process the paperwork, deal with the transactions. That's where my brain goes. It didn't even, still then, it didn't even think I was in sales. We're talking 2006. And again, I started in 2002 in the mortgage business. Then the person who was in charge of sales got fired. I instantly got promoted to VP of sales and operations. So I had to run both. And then I had to fix in sales. I had to build a sales process and go through that. 
the part that applies to this is that once I started training people in my first group, I can remember their faces. I literally can remember the room I was in and who I was talking to and what we were covering. I realized in that first training class that sales and sales training was presenting and public speaking, even sales. When you're selling somebody, then you are doing some form of public speaking where you have to know what you're talking about. You have to be able to deal with what might come up. Even this, right? This is public speaking. I'm, yes, I'm recording this. It's going into the camera. It's not in front of an audience, which again, this is a replay. And the reason why is because I'm on my way to go speak at a conference and which takes it to a completely different game on the public speaking side. But I realized in that moment that sales and sales training and leadership is like public speaking. There's so many elements. And at the time, I felt like I didn't know what I was doing. I had no idea how anything that worked. So I joined a thing called Toastmasters. And if you're not familiar with Toastmasters, and if you're in sales, sales leadership, training, management, I don't know, pretty much most things, um, check out Toastmasters International. You can Google it. Uh, I don't know what the website is specifically. Find Toastmasters. There is thousands and thousands of clubs. I promise wherever you live, there is a club nearby. Nice thing is you can go in for free. You can check out their meetings. You can do that for as long as you want. There's generally no pressure to become a member if you don't want to. It's definitely more fun when you do that if you decide. Toastmasters, and this is what freaks people out, is a place where you go voluntarily for fun or because you want to, weekly, monthly. I was at a club that was weekly. And you practice public speaking in front of other people for fun and without a court order. And most people think that's crazy. Most people, and there's been enough surveys and polls out there, most people put public speaking as their biggest fear ahead of death. I forget who it's attributed to. I heard this recently on a podcast. Uh, I, I feel like it was uh, like a, a, not a Zig Ziglar, but it's one of those people where they most the 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 phrase is most people would rather be in the box than giving the eulogy, right? Most people are more afraid of public speaking, and I'm not going to get into reasons why, than they are death. And so if that's you, or if you realize like you want to get better at speaking, communicating, thinking on your feet, as well as having a prepared conversation, a prepared script, a thing that you cover and that you know how to nail it and you can deal with it, audio, visual, all these things that you can learn, then find Toastmasters or the equivalent, join that and put in those efforts. And that for me was one of those things where I realized I'm strong over here, I'm weak here, but this weakness, if I can get this to be better, it will significantly help my career down the road. Now there's other weaknesses that I have, Graphic design, logos, branding, graphic arts, like I am not good at those. And uh, that doesn't necessarily help me. There's other people with those talents where they're much better at it. But that's an example of a weakness that I realized where if I improve that, even if I improved it a little bit, that would significantly help my other strengths and facilitate me doing more and more and being more effective and being more successful. And that's what you want to focus on is when you think about the weakness side, again, the goal isn't necessarily to focus on all the weaknesses, but what do you have that's getting in your way of where you want to be at in sales, where you want to be successful, how you're going to achieve what's on your vision board. If there's anything that's in the weakness column and what can you do to improve that? If you want any ideas, or if you're not sure, you're not sure what the weaknesses are, or you think you have some weaknesses, you've identified them, but you're not sure how to fix those or overcome them or improve them, email me, jason at cutterconsultinggroup.com. I'm very happy to chat with you, go back and forth, give you some ideas, things like Toastmasters, anything else that I have that comes to mind. I'm happy to share that with you. Um, and that's it for this episode. That's it for this session, session number four, the Authentic Persuasion Live training. I guess we should say the, the, the previously recorded training session. Again, join me every Friday at noon Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific. You can email me questions. You can find these episodes on LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube. Also, some of them are on Instagram. You can find the podcast under the Authentic Persuasion Show. 
I have a couple of other podcasts. So if you're in the call center industry, I have the Scalable Call Center podcast, which is great. There's a lot of experts I'm bringing on the show for that. And then I have my weekly show that I do on Wednesdays with Oliver Cat. It's the Call Center Confidence with Cutter and Cat show. It's also a podcast. You can find that as well. And then when in doubt, if you want to find books, podcasts, speaking, training, coaching. If you want help with your sales team, if you run an organization and you want help with uh, where to even start, we can do a gap analysis. We can do some advising. We can figure it out. We can build some training for you. You can always go to jasoncutter.com, which is my hub for everything that I have going on. Whatever you're looking for, go there, find what resonates, what would help you the most in your career or with your sales team. And then let's chat and uh, I'll do what I can to help you out. So that's it for session four. I appreciate you tuning in. Thanks so much. And I will catch you next week for the Authentic Persuasion 